Okay, good morning. Let's make sure that audio is not peaking. Okay, so as the notes and the chat says, um, today's going to be a pretty short stream uh, because I have to get over to a, uh, a live Q&A we're doing with uh, Study School and the rest of the guys from the Full Frame Lens Test, which if you haven't seen yet, you should definitely check out that test. also wanted the other reason it's going to be kind of short is I want to um, finally get you guys that special offer for the uh, driver set so we'll, we'll get those details out there I was really trying to get a countdown timer in the uh, in the bottom here <laughs> but uh, it wasn't working well <laughs> so oh well Okay, I did my usual plague of posts on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot, so we'll get this rolling. I did not brew my coffee this morning. I cheated and stopped at Starbucks, sadly. 
I'm not a not particularly a fan of Starbucks coffee, but uh, certainly gets the job done in a pinch. Okay. Oh, my flashlight's still dead. I didn't charge it. So the pretty much the only lens we're doing today is a like a 60 millimeter macro. Um, and uh, if that goes really well and smooth, then I might, I have a, another Nikkor S, which is not common, uh, but I might pull that out, and work on that. Jasper, excited for the Q&A. Yeah, me too. Um, it kind of just sort of got thrown together real quick, but I think it's gonna be really cool because it's the only, uh, it's the only time the four of us will be back together after the test. So it'll be me, uh, Mark Lafleur, the, the pretty much the brain behind it, um, Brent from ShareGrid, and Kyle Stryker, the actual DP or camera operator for the entire test. Uh, and us four have been sort of the the mainstays throughout all of the the full frame, all of the um, you know the anamorphic, the vintage, and now full frame test. So. That should be really fun to have all of us back together because we haven't seen each other since that wrap party. So the lens today, like a R, 60 millimeter macro. Looks to be in pretty good shape, very good shape actually. All the paint is really nice. All the engravings are nice and clean. Um, very, very little wear on the mount. Yeah, it's too shiny. <laughs> um, the glass is in fantastic condition, so this should go really smoothly. A tiny little, nope, that wiped off. Focus is a little heavy, but that's, um, that's sort of par for the course for this lens because it telescopes so much. Um, Leica had to keep it pretty, pretty stiff, pretty high tolerance. Or at least that's my assumption. Yeah, that stuff on the mount cleaned off super easy. That's, that's already gone. So this should go really, really well. First time catching it live. Welcome, Mr. Khan. My framing is a little off today. Let's bring this down. I had my whole bench cleared off um, yesterday or on uh, Thursday because we were doing some unique projects and I needed as much space as possible. Benjamin, any top level suggestions or warnings to people who might use the full frame tests for future productions? Uh, warnings? No, it's it's a fantastic tool. In fact, I think once I'm done with this lens, um, hey Max, good morning. I'm gonna jump into sort of a screen share of the full frame lens test because there are some tips I have to using it to the best um, that it has to offer. So uh, hang out for that. 
um, and I'll show you exactly how to use the full frame lens test on ShareGrid. Or the whole lens test, not just the full frame stuff. Because you'll have access to uh, the, the vintage lenses, the uh, full frame lenses, and the anamorphic lenses. Ooh, that came out super easy. There's absolutely no thread locker on these. I also need to change some of my lighting here to be a little more accommodating. If only I knew a, a cinematographer that could help me out. Learned a ton from the Lens Geek segment you did. Oh, the... Uh, you're talking about the expensive lens versus cheap lens thing? That was a lot of fun when I did that with them, but it was terrifying. The cheap lens versus expensive lens was scary because um, it was, you know, I've seen a lot of those videos. It was like the cheap bread versus expensive bread and cheese and wine and all those things where they have an expert that can tell the difference by smelling something or whatever. And I don't know how those channels do those, but um, when the guys from um, the channels that actually produced that video when they approached me wow this is sticky um they legitimately wanted me to to guess i had no idea what was what i had no access to the footage prior it was l completely secretive so i was a little terrified if i said something completely wrong it could make me look like an idiot so I told them ahead of time, you know, I'll do this, but if I fail miserably, uh, you know, I'd appreciate it if you just threw the footage away. So we did it. Um, and thankfully I was able to tell what was what and it worked really, really well. So I'm glad for everybody that it worked out. is still caught on something. Do you know how good or bad a lens like R performs with serial number? Um, no, I don't know, Max. That's impossible to tell. Good morning, Marcin. Um, it's impossible to tell based on the serial number. You could have an idea of where it should perform, but the serial number won't tell you how well or poorly it's been cared for in the past 20, 30, 40 years, however old that lens is. This baffle is stuck in here. What's going on? Ah, I see, I see. Hey, 
Hey Matthew, do you think the price difference for Leica R's from the 70s to 80s compared to a 90s set is justified? Again, I would say that completely depends on the condition they're in. If you can find a set of 70s or 80s Leica R's that are mint, and I mean truly mint, then yeah, I wouldn't hesitate at all to pay for those. But if they're just gouging because they can, then yeah, I probably wouldn't, uh, I probably wouldn't bother. <laughs> I don't know what this is being held on by anymore. This baffle is a, uh, it's an odd one. It's super long. It goes way down inside because it's a macro. And it's caught on something. And it should just come straight out. If you were setting that test up for fellow lens geek, what would you do to trip somebody up <laughs> if that was your goal? Uh, if I was gonna trip somebody up, I would take, uh, I mean, that's, that's tricky. It, it would depend on how far I'm looking to embarrass them. I think I would probably take a uh, a really cheap, not cheap, a, a relatively affordable modern cine lens, and then a uh, industry standard expensive lens from one of the big brands, and compare those two and show them that you don't need a, a six-figure lens. Otis versus Leica Sumalux C. Yeah, that's, hey, good morning, Phil. That's kind of the idea. You take something that's a quarter or, you know, even an eighth of the price of a, a high-end cine lens and uh, show them that and then show them a super high-end cine lens. And they probably can't tell the difference. When I did the cheap versus expensive thing, they did me a favor by, by telling me that one was a very, very cheap common lens, and the other was a high-end cine lens. If I hadn't known that, then it really could have been anything. I don't know what this baffle is holding on to anymore. I need to, need to find my service notes for this lens which I don't feel like digging through right now. Let's see, there's the original alignment. And that's where it should be popping up. No problem, note to self films. I don't know your actual name. Yeah, this is a pain. I'm not sure why it's, um, what it's hanging on to. I think maybe the spring is caught on the bottom of the baffle. Oh, that is what it is, because I can see just through. I don't know, that's not gonna show up on camera because it's it's too shadow, it's too much, um, it's too much shadow. But. It's right there. It's just sticking on it. So I might have to take this part from the front to release that spring. All right, anyways, I'll do the rest of the mod for now and I'll finish up the declicking later.
they told you way too much. They said 50 millimeter 1.8. I think that's it tells you that blends. Well, that was also after I had established which one was which, which was the whole point is if I could tell the identifying the exact lens was just the cherry on top. The point of that video was to see if I could tell which one was cheap and which one was expensive. Um, I got lucky being able to tell the exact lens after they gave me some clues, but the, like I said, the point of it was to be able to determine which is cheap and which one's expensive. Is the editing not linear? Some of it's not, because they had some segments where they asked me to define certain things I was looking at. So when I would say, uh, oh, that, uh, you know, I see that chromatic operation, I see that focus breathing, all those little things, after the, a lot of the, um, the clips, they had me go back and explain what was what. Oh, hey, Brian. So in that regard, some of it's not linear. They had, they cut in the, the explanation pieces, but as far as I remember, granted that was a long time, but that was over a year ago. Um, as far as I remember, the rest of it, the, the clips that I'm watching are linear. In a vintage lens, how would you rate Takamar lenses compared to contact Zeiss? Mm, similar. But I wouldn't intercut them with each other. Um, I think the Takumars are going to have a slightly more vintage look to them. So maybe slightly lower contrast, uh, a little bit more character. But not much compared to like our or to um, size contacts. Okay. I know last week I promised the um, the driver set <laughs> promo stuff, which we are going to get to. So if you were here for last weekend and you saw the stuff I was talking about, the driver set, stick around. go back to my notes for this baffle. But that's okay, because now we can set it aside and get to this guy. I'll leave that off for now. So, okay, the... 
Is there a lens that you know of that could be somewhat of a replacement for the Leica R 19mm? Mm, the version 1 or the version 2? Those are very, very different lenses. The version 2, that's a really good lens. Uh, nothing specific comes to mind because everything's going to be a lot slower. I mean, you could toss in like uh, a Zeiss Contact 18, but that's an f4. Or you could do like the Zeiss Classic, which is a 3.5. Um, nothing specific comes to mind as a replacement for the f2.8 19mm. Especially the version 2. I guess the closest thing would be the contacts. Super impractical question. If I use a super wide 4x5 lens on a bellows with one of those Garflock backs to a mirrorless, would the image have the characteristic of large format just cropped? It. Hmm. Let's see, how do I explain this properly? <laughs> By characteristics, what do you mean? Nothing, in terms of the image, nothing will change other than the crop. I've got a Tomioka Yashinon 55 1.2 M42 mount lens. Any chance you work on those? I don't think I have before. Well, that's weird that you guys both just ask about that lens back to back. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that lens specifically. Uh, I have seen some Yashinon lenses, but not uh, not specifically for mods, only for funsy stuff. All right, so the driver sets are on the website and what we're gonna do Actually, let me put it together here. For anybody that's watching the stream, anybody can go buy the, the kit, but for you guys that watch the mod stream, what we're gonna do is add custom engraving, um, no, no extra, for the same price. So, sounds like an infomercial now, sorry. Um, there's two places we can engrave it. On the website, it shows a little box right here. So we could do like a, a custom logo or just your name straight across. The other place that I really like that I was gonna do some is a name down the, the spine. So um, basically you're gonna wanna buy the set and then um, actually I'll show you. Let me see if I can do that. It's easier just to show you. Can I get Firefox back? Ah, here we go. That'll work. Um, so You'll want to go to, oh, what was it? Oh, go to, here, I'll put it in the chat. I think that's the correct, let's try that. Yeah, okay, so you go to that link and there's two items that'll show up. Pull it up here in Firefox. So what you do is add both of these items to your cart. Because most people won't bother, they won't see the laser engraving. Nobody's gonna pay for laser engraving at $99. So what you do is you add both of those items and when the cart sees that they're both in there, it'll automatically make the engraving free. So add that. got to check the little box and then you can just click here it'll take you to it 
add to cart. Now your cart will show, there you go. See, $99, but it's still, total is only $24.99. Throw in stickers and whatnot while you're there. There you go. And then shipping, uh, it'll charge you for shipping, obviously. And tax, it knows that I'm in California, so it's gonna charge me California sales tax. But if you're not in California, it won't charge you sales tax. As soon as you put in a, um, a mailing or shipping address. So grab them now. Um, we don't have a ton of them, so I wouldn't wait too long. But uh, once you do that, and once we get the order, we'll, we'll contact you and figure out what and where you want it engraved. Um, I really like the spine engraving, which is probably what I'm going to do to mine. Uh, and we're doing a bunch for our staff also. I think that's really, it'll be, you know, like, like one of our technicians will be E. Madison or whichever technician it goes to. If, if Evan's watching, spoiler alert, I hope he's not watching. It was supposed to be a, a surprise. <laughs> but yeah, I think the spine engraving will be really nice. But yeah, if you have like a production company or a rental company or something, we could do a nice big logo right there and it'll be really nice. So yeah, I've been testing the bits, like I said in previous streams for over a month. Actually, no, it's coming up on two months now. Um, and I've been very, very happy with the, the quality and the reliability. Um, all right, let's follow up with that other question. Regarding 4x5 Demira's characters, vanishing lines, relative size of objects, how foreground objects obscure background objects compression. So n technically, no, it won't stay the same because when you take that four by five lens and put it onto, uh, it, it, they will stay the same. The issue is, and this is where the big argument in uh, the full frame look or the medium format look, um, what happens is once you crop down to a smaller format, you've got to change your focus distance significantly so to get that same reasonable field of view or, or angle of view um, you've got to back way up which changes the characteristics strictly because of the distance um, if you if nothing else changed if you took the same lens you kept your distance the same uh, you kept your focus distance the same you kept your aperture the same then it would be identical just a, a cropped image. It would be the same as taking that full image, dropping it in Photoshop and cropping it down 75% or whatever that crop factor becomes. So the actual look does not change whatsoever. It only changes when you change your focus distance and your angle of view. Anyway, I can come pick up a driver set. Shipping is expensive. Oh, I didn't. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yes, you can definitely come pick it up, but let me, what am I doing? We have, so we, <laughs> we get a lot of shipping complaints through our website because most of the stuff that we're shipping is really delicate, expensive, um, sensitive cine lenses. And when we're shipping something like a, you know, durable screwdriver kit it doesn't really make sense so I need to um, we have basically a separate category for things that don't require um, extra packaging and extra care and extra attention and I did not add it to that which might help. But yeah, you can definitely come pick it up if you want. All right, I just 
added it to the, the non-delicate collection, so that it should help a little bit. Um, but if it's still ridiculous, yeah, if you're in Reseda, that's like a 10-minute drive. You can definitely just come pick it up. Um, at checkout, just... Um, mm, how do you do that? Because you're already using... Oh, use um, in the discount code area. Here, I'll show you here. Once you get to this section, put pick up, P-I-C-K-U-P, -P, in the discount code, and we'll automatically know to hold it. Uh-oh. Oh, you can't do that. Well, if you want to pick it up, just drop me a follow-up email and we'll... We'll hold on, hold on to it at will call and go from there. So that shouldn't be an issue. You can definitely, we're never going to tell someone they can't pick up. Um, so once you, Marston, once you purchase it, um, you'll get the confirmation email and we'll follow up with another email. Um, asking for the art. So it basically it has to be a vector file. That's how lasers work. You can't, we can do a JPEG, but it looks weird because instead of the way the laser works, instead of actually engraving a line or a pattern, what it does for JPEGs is it does millions of dots. So sometimes it looks okay, uh, but more often than not, the, the JPEG or a bitmap was what it really comes down to. Um, just looks kind of weird. I, I don't recommend that. So if you have a vector file with firm lines, black and white, that's ideal. Um, what was the other question? What happened to Caldwell Chameleon Primes? What do you mean what happened? They're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're still available. Um, they're very slow to produce them because it's really just a couple of guys actually building them. Um, I think, I think there were a couple sets that went to either Australia or New Zealand. I can't remember. Um, they had some arrangement early on where the first, like, however many sets were slated to go straight to Down Under. Um, but yeah, they could still be ordered. What aspect ratio for the file? Mm, I don't know. Oh, Phil just asked that too, what size? Well, if you're doing the name part here, I mean, it's just gonna be text. It's gonna be pretty small. I'd say maybe, i tell you exactly. You guys get the, the scoop here. Let's call it, I'll give it to you in millimeters. Well, it's seven and a half millimeters tall by however long. I mean, you couldn't possibly fill up this entire thing. Uh, and then the box, if you want something on the front, let's call it... I mean, if we're really stretching it, 50 millimeters by 90. Eh, we can even call it 100. 50 by 100, so two to one. Shipping the driver's set. Oh, 150. See, that's the, the problem. Ah, geez. Let me, um... It should not be $155. You're absolutely right. Um, but FedEx and our e-commerce platform butt heads constantly. So... Let me see if I can change that. Um, what I'll do is I'll also allow uh, USPS, which should be a lot cheaper. Hmm. OK. 
Okay, nobody order. Give it a second to update. You guys are my, my guinea pigs for this, so thank you. Okay, that should work. All right, go ahead and refresh all your pages. Um, it should give you a cheaper shipping option now for, for Amsterdam. Who was asking about that? Oh, Fatal Touch. Touch! <laughs> okay. Thankfully, no one is trying to... Yeah. <laughs> so you may or may not get them, and you may or may not have a fair election. Um, Cam Bob, yeah. Um, you'll get a confirmation email once you purchase it, and then just... Uh, reply to that email and say, hey, I want to pick it up. The other thing you should do so that the tax is correct, um, put our address as the shipping address, and that'll do two things. One, it'll make the tax correct, and two, uh, we'll know to hold it for you so that it doesn't get shipped anywhere. Lots of, lots of Dutch folks watching the stream. Much appreciated. I plan to build a kit of contact size to send you for cine modding for use on mirrorless. Do you have a standard line on where to look for these and what to look for when buying? Uh, for contacts lenses specifically, I would try KEH as your first option. Um, they're, they're probably gonna be slightly more expensive than searching eBay. Uh, oh good, it worked. Dutchies. <laughs> Is that the, the agreed term, Dutchies? Um, yeah, keh.com. And then, I mean, keep an eye on uh, Facebook groups and private sellers, but always ask for as many photos as possible. And if you are gonna go through something like eBay or a private sale, um, I, my, my biggest piece of advice is make sure that they offer a return policy or a return period, maybe five days, 10 days, whatever. Um, any time I see something on eBay and it says no returns accepted, whatever, it's kind of a red flag. Uh, not so much these days because a lot of people are strapped for cash and they're just trying to get rid of gear and they don't want to deal with returns and going back and forth they they try their best to list everything as accurate as possible but if somebody is selling a lens and they say it's mint perfect you know brand new whatever all those those adjectives um and they don't re and they don't offer a return period that's a red flag if if they're claiming that it's mint or it's as good as it can be they should be standing behind that and offering a return period. If it's a, a busted up old lens and they're selling it for parts and it is what it is, then I could understand selling it as is. That makes sense to me. They don't wanna, they don't want you to get the lens and then say, you know, hey, this has a lot of scratches on the front. And they say, yeah, the listing said that. Vintage lenses Facebook groups are great. Yeah, vintage lenses for video, um, just cinema lenses. Granted, that's a little more cinema specific, not so much photo. Um, I know a lot of people buy and sell stuff in vintage lenses for video. Uh, the cine lens, that, that's our, that's the Duclos sort of unofficial Facebook group, um, but there's no selling allowed there, so that's not gonna be a good resource. You could put a, a post in the cine lens um, asking if anyone has them. Um, what else? Oh, uh, lensfinder.com, one of my previous 
uh, endeavors, check that site. Thank you, Fatal Dutch. We will email you for your engraving options. All right, I have about an hour left until I have to leave for the, um, the Q&A. So what I'm gonna do now is go over the, the lens test for you guys. Let's see, how is the best way? I think I'm just gonna make this basically full screen. Oh, my aspect ratio is all off. Bear with me here. Bye. Okay. Oh no. That was weird. Sorry, this is probably making you guys dizzy. I apologize. All right, that's good enough. And I'm still here. Ta-da. Okay, so um, if any of you aren't familiar with the full frame lens test, it was, um, it started with uh, vintage lenses and then we did anamorphic lenses and then the most recent one was full frame lenses. And the purpose of it originally was to really just have a tool where you could compare a huge variety of lenses side by side. You guys are heroes, thank you. <laughs> I can't take too much credit. It, it, it started as primarily with Brent and Mark. Um, yeah, it's a ton of work and it literally was an entire production. Um, so when we started, it was primarily with the vintage lenses because that's Mark's rental house, is uh, a rental company, is vintage, or uh, old fast glass. Uh, he primarily specialized in vintage high-speed lenses, so he really wanted a way to show everyone. And then Sherger got involved and they came up with this concept, which is to me the, the key part of it, the quad player. Um, that's really what makes it special. So the way this works, uh, I think you go here. So yeah, it's not a paywall, but it's a sign up wall. You gotta give them your info. So let's just say Phil Holland. That's my name. Oh, I have to give a password? Let's see if it lets me. Nope. Password one, two, three. Oops. Now you can all sign in with Phil's login. Ugh. So once you sign up, you'll have pretty much unlimited access to it. All right, so the way it works here, and again, this is the really, really clever part. So the lens test was, there's three separate tests, all multiple days, but the unique part about it is we used um, the same workflow, the same lights, the same model, the same, most of the same crew. Uh, so test to test the 
the comparison is as accurate as it can be. So you pick who is somebody was asking about a lens. The TLS Nikkor. Oh yeah, Zero Optic did the Nikkors. Let's do that. So it shows right here. Full frame lens test 2019. Uh, anamorphic was 2017. And the vintage lens was 2016. So let's try that. Let's do the zero optic. Oh, it's under Nikkor, I think. Yeah. So you can grab, let's say, the 50 at T13. Then I want to compare, I don't know. Oh, here, F Canon FD 50 millimeter at, oh, it's a 55 at T13. <coughs> and let's see. Uh, like a R, so we're going all rehoused here. 50 T15. And how about what do I use for the fourth lens? Anybody? Suggestions? Let's do a Mark III Super Speed. There we go. 50 at T13. So you select your four lenses and you click start the test. And normally I'd have a, a larger window and you'd be able to see all four, but the really clever thing here is that it plays those tests simultaneously. So one of the big differences here is these three are full frame and this lens is super 35. So that's why it looks like a tighter crop, because it is. But they actually showed that. Let's try that again real quick and I'll pause it. Right there. See that I oh, can't see it with the stupid suggestions. But it shows you the crop for the for Super 35 on those full frame lenses. So uh, let's see on this one that is Super 35. It's pretty much to the bottom of her hair, maybe like halfway up her shoulder. So if you look here, it's almost the same, maybe slightly different. So the actual field of view, if you were looking at um, Super 35, would be pretty much the same. So the thing that I get the most use out of in this quad viewer is the bokeh. These little, this, this background here that we shot the same test and the same settings and everything. Slightly different between these two because these were um, two different times but it's as similar as it possibly could be. And then when they focus close on the microphone, right here, this one's already going. Oh no, that's the far distance, and then it goes close. But you really get an idea of what these lenses do side by side, like there's, there's no comparison. So now it goes to her face, now it's gonna go close to the microphone. Look at that. That's a huge difference. So it's such a useful tool for comparing. Oh, and then the off axis, you know, put her face at the edge of the frame. You could see if it's going to destroy. You know, see, this gets really soft here. This, that stays pretty clean, but that's super 35. So it's really, really useful um, if you're uh, if you're setting up for production and you're talking with your producer or your um, your designer, whoever is making those choices. You can go through this and figure out what's going to be the best fit for you. Ancient. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Pre 1960. Yeah, the that Nikkor is a very old lens. 
relatively old. And then the flare test, and most of this is going to be pretty similar. Um, oh, that one's a lot. This, I guess we did this differently. <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, but the similarities between these two, the Canon FD and the Nikkor, you can see all those subtle differences. Ah, uh, different focus chart. Uh, but it's really handy to see all these tiny things. And it's, I mean, if you're talking about prepping for a job and you're trying to decide whether or not you want to go spherical or anamorphic, you could do that too. Let's say you wanted to shoot something newer. Um, CNEs, we'll do a, again, we'll go down to 50. T13. And then you want to go maybe something anamorphic. Atlas. Let's say you're trying to decide between CNEs and Atlas. 65, T2. And then maybe something with a little bit of a vintage kick, the Sumire. And let's say maybe Sigma Classic. There we go. So it'll, again, it just goes and resets the whole thing. Starts from scratch. So you get the same results. And it's just super handy to see everything you're doing. Yeah, so you're getting a lot of distortion here. Her face is stretched much wider than I would like. This is a lot cleaner. And again, you have you have a significant more height to this image. If you were gonna, sh if you wanted to deliver in a sixteen by nine or two four zero, all you would do is chop off the top and bottom, and you have a very similar frame. But you get to look at the differences in bokeh and the out of focus areas. See, this is proper oval bokeh compared to, it's a huge difference. But keep in mind, Max says uh, the flares are a bit misleading on a black background. I wish somebody had done this test in multiple locations. <laughs> uh, that would have been, I mean, the, the full frame ones alone was like, I think it was five or six days of shooting. And then the post on that was months. I do like this look a lot. And her face is slightly different. I mean, this, this is almost two years apart. And our model, Corey, obviously we don't expect her to keep the same physique and... But it's, I mean, you notice, it's the same shirt. She wore the same dress. Yeah, see, look at those flares. That's a big difference. But this is the kind of thing. In, in, in pre-production, you can show this to your the rest of your team and make that decision like okay yeah we really want these flares we're going with atlas instead of a spherical option uh, the classics have really nice flares too that some people really hunt for that type of flare um what was someone else asking for Panavision lens and the anamorphic lens has, has the classic Panavision vertical stretch when changing focus. I haven't seen that in anything else but Panavision. Um, you might see that in the uh, the Caldwell Chameleons because they use a very similar technique for achieving that squeeze. Um, I don't know what else. 
Which is so funny that you bring that up, Jasper, because that's one of those characteristics that people can't wait to get rid of, and now all of a sudden they want it back. Um, who else was asking? Somebody was asking for something. Oh, uh, 35 Nikor. Let's do that. Let's do the... Where is that? Nikor AIS 35 T15. How about uh, Canon FD 35? That'll be a, a good comparison. It's only T21. That's going to be a huge difference in the bokeh. How about uh, Canon K35? Which is going to be, should be very similar. The same same concept and then let's well, let's have some fun and throw in a Roken on <laughs> you know what hold on let me let me see if I can... There, now you can see all four at the same time. So we have, what is this, the Nikon, an FD, K35, and a Rokinon. So far, the FD has the, well, it's the slowest at T21, but has the least pleasing bokeh to me. Um, I don't particularly like this bokeh where the, the edges have that highlight. So now we're gonna go to the microphone. That'll give us the background way out of focus. So right there, I don't like these highlight rings at the edge of the bokeh. This has it to a little bit to some degree. Uh, the K35 is really smooth, really soft and pillowy. And then the Rokinon has it a little bit as well. It's got a little bit of artifacting, which I'm not a huge fan of. But like this, you could see in the bokeh, that's it's just got a weird almost like it creates another shape and it's really distracting to me. Uh, Max says, Panavision has the breathing in only one direction. That's cool. They say it's cool for focusing on the actor. Uh, I think that they couldn't correct that and tried to spin it as a feature. Uh, whatever. You say what you want about that particular um, artifact. But for those Panavision lenses, that, as far as I know, the cause of that is their anti-astigmatizer, which is something that they had the patent on, and I believe it has expired. Yeah, so to me, in this test, the K35 uh, takes the cake for... for Pure aesthetics. So I'm not going to sit here and watch these all day. Point being, there's no limit. I mean, you can pick any of the lenses from all three different tests and compare them side by side, and it'll give you the best, uh, the best, most consistent comparison that you can get without going and renting all of these lenses and doing your own test. Wow, that's a huge difference. That's the FD... Yeah, the Rokinon being the newest has the least amount of K35 
character to the flare. A machinist friend in Simi Valley was using Nikkor still lens blocks for Panavision lenses they made. Yeah, Panavision has not made a lot of lenses. Almost all of their stuff, that, that's sort of how they built their business, was um, repurposing other equipment. That's common knowledge these days. It wasn't back then. Do you know anything about the Zellmu's Apollo Anamorphic? I do. Uh, they are a legit kind of company. I mean, I'm not sure if you're asking like if they're a real group of lens manufacturers. Um, I have not seen the Zellmuse lens in person, if that gives you any indication of where they stand. <laughs> so anyways, that's the test. Um, you can log on, sign up, play around with this. I mean, the possibility, like comparing things you know, let's. I'll do one more. Let's do Atlas Orion. Uh, I want to do all anamorphic. Cook anamorphic, special flare. Um, let's do. Where's the Panavision? Panavision. Auto Panatar. Which is not a. It's not an ideal representation of. Oh, and Lomo, yeah, we'll do that. The the Panatar is not an ideal representation of Panavision Anamorphics because um, it's a very old design. It predates a lot of the stuff that they currently have. Uh, in fact, Panavision didn't want us using the lens at all in the test, and we basically said, sorry, we're going to do it. <laughs> I don't know why we only had the 65. That's odd. But let's use that as the baseline. Uh, let's do 75. It's probably closer. Have you serviced white point optics lenses before? Uh, very, very minimal. Their, their designs are relatively simple, um, not too dissimilar from Cook, the way Cook designs all of their primes, which is, again, in turn, the same that TLS and Zero Optic. It's all sort of the same cam system concept. Um, I can't say a whole lot for White Point. Um, their stuff is, is kind of a question mark. I know they do a lot, but when you do that much, it's kind of hard to maintain consistency and reliability. So, Not a ton of differences here. The, what is this? The Atlas has the most, it looks like, yeah, see, it, it is squishing her face. Her face got wider when it went out of focus. And now her face is a lot narrower. So it is doing that stretchy bit. Oh yeah, look at the, the squish there. That's, I would not put a model at the edge of the frame there. <laughs> Or an actress, actor. See that? That squish. Ooh. Same thing here in the Panavision. But the Atlas and the Lomo keep her relatively accurate. Here we go, the flares. I mean, take your pick. They all have the horizontal blue. The Panavision doesn't, it's not a huge blue, but it also has this crazy diagonal. If 
For the flare, I might prefer the cook the most. That's pretty nice, pretty pleasing. Maybe the Lomo as well. Which I've always said, I love the look of Lomos. I just can't stand their mechanical design. It's terrible. Don't really understand why Panavision doesn't sell lenses, cameras, software, and just keep the services as free. Uh, because they're not a retailer. They're, they're a, a rental company. That's their older anamorphic stuff. Their newer lenses have very different flare and rendering. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Phil. The Panavision? Um, another fun fact about Panavision and their glass. They're, one of the reasons that they are allowed to, uh, to own and rent some of their more exotic stuff. So everybody knows about the the ban on lead and some other materials in manufacturing of lenses, uh, which is why you don't see a recreation of something like Super Speeds or the Cook Pancros. You can't use those lead materials, lead and arsenic, different materials that have been banned. Um, the reason that Panavision is allowed to get away with it is because they don't sell anything. They can make their lenses similar to the way they used to uh, with those materials that aren't legal to sell because they're not selling them. They're only renting them. Would you know why there's so many rehousing options for vintage still lenses but not for vintage anamorphic like Lomos? Uh, because nobody wants to touch Lomos. The mechanical design on those lenses is atrocious. Uh, I, I I don't know of anyone that wants to dive into those and deal with the problems that come out of them. It's it's the, for the same reason that we don't service them here at Duke Close Lenses. Even if you're just harvesting the glass and putting it into a new housing, the glass itself I, there's there's bubbles in the glass casting, the edge paint flakes off all the time. Uh, it's just a it's a giant hazard for anyone that even considers rehousing them because you're going to go through all that work and someone's going to pay a lot of money for that rehousing and it's still going to fail. It's still going to have pieces of edge paint that flake off into the glass. Uh, and of course, those customers that paid a lot of money are going to come back and say, hey, I paid good money for this. You need to fix it. And whoever does that rehousing is going to be forced to provide free labor, essentially. Interesting, although I've heard that Zeiss still does, still dopes their glass with lead. Mm. I don't think a company as large as Zeiss would take a risk like that. I highly doubt that. I crave bubbles in glass. <laughs> it's part of the character. I can't argue with that. You know? That's if if you're buying a set of Lomos and you're complaining about the image quality, then you probably shouldn't have bought Lomos. That's the whole purpose of them. Oh, I didn't see this before. You can share this test. That's pretty cool. So if I wanted to share these four lenses with a producer or uh, or someone, I guess you can share that exact loadout. Let's see if that changes with that OOS. If we change one thing, does it give us a new... It doesn't. So maybe it just loads the player, I don't know. But still, you could... Especially in our current condition of the industry, you could hop on a Zoom call with a producer or a production designer and go through these options and discuss all the different nuances without having to go to a rental house get a camera set up for prep, ask them for every lens they have. Uh, oh, where did that question go? Have you seen anything from White Point like our anamorphic rehousing already? Oh, the Lomocron? I have not seen those in person. I've only seen pictures they put up. Uh, 
Um, Max and Fatal Dutch, yes, the one of the head guys at Hawk is a he's a old school Russian optical engineer that, as far as I know, had done work for Lomo. So there is some there's some influence in Hawks from Lomo, but um, they're not made at the Lomo factory. They're not. Um, I mean, that's really where the similarities end. It's kind of like having, I don't know if any of you are car guys, but back when the Ford Fusion came out, they had nabbed the designer from like Aston Martin or something like that. And everyone loved the look of the Ford Fusion. And they said it was very, very Aston inspired, strictly because they got one of the designers from Aston Martin. That's similar in this case. It doesn't make it an Aston Martin at all. Uh, and that doesn't make Hawk lenses Lomo lenses. There's a Dutch group friend Demon is doing Lomo anamorphic rehousings, but a YouTuber anamorphic on a budget say they took forever. Yeah. Yeah, Van Diemen's been in business for a very long time. Um, their stuff is clever. Uh, it's unique. They had one of the most unique focus mechanisms I've ever seen. I believe they called it the wire form. Um, it's a nightmare to service, but it was very interesting. Tito for, oh, he's that, that guy on YouTube, yeah. He's got some pretty cool content. I like his stuff. Um, I tend to steer clear of the the super low budget DIY, you know, anamorphic front duct taped onto a taking lens strapped to a GH4. I, I kind of stay away from that because it's fun and I love the, the images that people are getting, but from a professional perspective, there's not much I can offer. Uh, you know, people will reach out from time to time and say, hey, I, I paired up this anamorphic with this taking lens. Can you make it, can you tune it? And I can't, uh, at least not, not reasonably affordable <laughs> I mean it, yes it can be tuned and it could be made better but it would cost more than probably what most people paid for those components so anyways that's the test Ooh, about the test what's this oh this is back to the yeah so there's the three tests got a bunch of cool quotes Greg Frazier um, yeah so that was a perfect example Greg used the test in pre-production to choose the lenses he was going to use for, I forget what the project was. But yeah, that's a perfect note. Because of that, I was able to make an informed decision for my next film. We had a, we have a lot of people from the ASC that use it. Hey, I know that guy. That's me. Phil, there you are, Phil. Chris Probst, ASC. Uh, Rachel Morrison, I know she loved the test. She used it for something. I can't remember what, but yeah, very cool. Really nice little commercial there. Non-biased, that's another important factor because the test did have sponsors, but it was strictly financial to pay the crew and to pay for, you know, crafty and stuff. Um, none of the manufacturers had any influence on how we did the test. None of them came in and said, oh, you can use these lenses, but don't do this. The majority of lenses that we had for the first two tests came from private owners, not from the manufacturers. Um, once we had a decent number of eyeballs on the first two tests and then the full frame lens test came out, it was uh, it, it had a lot more credibility, so we were able to reach out to some manufacturers to get really early lenses, like this, the Canon Sumires, they were brand new, we were able to get those from Canon. Um, the Sigma Classics were extremely hard to get a hold of because they were only, I can't remember the numbers, but Sigma produced those in such a limited quantity, they were sold out before they were even available on retailers' websites. So we were able to get a lot of that really rare stuff that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get from a private owner. So that helped a lot, having the support of the manufacturers. Hundreds, yeah. I mean, if you think about these tests, going back to that quad player, 
all of those different lenses and then shot wide open. And then again at the next stop down and then again at the next, I think it's somewhere between two and four stops per lens. So it's a lot. I'm sure that Brent and Mark will know, or Kyle will probably know best since he was the one that was actually on the camera. Um, they'll probably know more accurately how many actual shots there were. It has to be in the thousands. Um, for most of those tests, I was socked away in a darkroom doing the projection tests. So I don't, you can't click on it. That's kind of a bummer. But yeah, the people involved were awesome. Everybody there was a fantastic contributor. Everybody had a specific job. Everybody knew what they were doing. Um, you know, we had A camera that was shooting the actual test. There was B camera and C camera doing focus charts and distortion charts, which you can kind of see. Like there's the distortion chart, there's the focus chart, uh, but they were separate setups, separate cameras. So the workflow was amazing. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, I am probably going to hop over and start getting ready for that Q&A now, uh, which I linked to early in the chat here. Let me find it. There we go. So yeah, if you haven't, Um, I mean, I can, I gave you guys a bunch of insight just now, but nothing compared to what Mark and Brent and Kyle are going to give you. So definitely go sign up for that. Um, it starts at noon, about 35 minutes. Um, and that should be really interesting. I hope, I, 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 like I said, I haven't seen the guys in person. Uh, I've seen Mark. Mark does a lot of work with us and he's dropped off and picked up. Um, but yeah. Uh, you'll get so much more insight from them. You'll be able to ask them really relevant questions. So definitely sign up for that. Um, I think it'll send you an email right away with the link. It's just, I think it's just a Zoom platform. Not sure. Um, but yeah, that should be really cool. And then get those orders in for the driver kits. Oh, you can't see my desktop anymore. Not my desk, my, my physical desktop, not my virtual, my bench desktop. But yeah, get those in. Um, those are definitely going to be limited. I'm interested to see what people choose to put there or here or on the back. I mean, honestly, we could do it anywhere on the, on the case, except for the plastic bits here and the plastic bit here. Oh, and these will all have... Do close, they all come engraved, but we can do um, on the handle as well. If you want something there, just let me know in that in that email. We could do some custom bits there. Nice, thank you, Marcin. And um, definitely subscribe. That was supposed to be a requirement. You were supposed to subscribe to get this deal, but if you're watching, that's good enough for me. But please do subscribe. Do Zeiss EMs get modded? I saw you have a poor focus. Uh, sorry, they have poor focus throughs. We can mod some of the ZMs. The issue with those is they have a little bump on the focus ring, so we have to cut out an extra bit um, on the gear to accommodate that bump. So they're doable, it's just trickier. So we can support you as a YouTuber with that. With what? with buying swag or, or merch, whatever. That supports us through the whole COVID lockdown because production still hasn't gotten up and running um, here in LA. Why no JIS? JIS for the, for the driver bits? Or what do you mean? I'm not sure what Cam Bob is asking. It's pretty clever though. I like 
everything gets just stays in there nice and neat. Nothing, nothing falls out because they're all held in by magnets. Um, and everything I can, I mean, I'm sure you guys see it on the stream all the time. You can do the whole thing one-handed if you want, but they just click in there and they're pretty reliable. Yes, the bits. I, so we actually talked about having very specific bits made um, specifically for JIS or JCIS um, screws. That would have been way more expensive. And to be honest, I've been using primarily this top, the top two rows on tons of JIS, JCIS screws, and I've had no issues whatsoever. Um, the mod stuff you see me do is almost all JIS screws and the, the a lot of the other stuff that we're doing, um, I wasn't going to show anything on the stream, but like this is part of our um, Fujinon MKRF conversion, which is here somewhere. But all of the screws on this are JIS and the bits have been working perfectly. So um, I have no complaints whatsoever. But to have them manufactured to actual JS specs would have been way more expensive. The kit that retails for 25 bucks would have been more like 50 bucks, if not more. Which is why, I mean, most of these bits you'll never use. Like this tri point, it's not focusing. You'll never use that. That's for like obscure um, Chinese electronics stuff, like on uh, consumer level toys and stuff. But it's there. Your your primer as a as a lens tech, you'll use these top two rows and then some of these torques on certain lenses from time to time. But yeah, the Phillips and the flatheads are going to be the most popular, the most common. All right, I am going to go hop into that Zoom call. Uh, hopefully I see some of you guys there. If you do show up, I assume they're going to have the chat open. Um, just tell them that you came from the mod stream with me and that'll be, that'll be helpful. You know, show your support. Uh, all right, then uh, we'll definitely have a lot more actual modding next weekend. I just wanted to, to jump in here. I know it's super short today, but um, wanted to show up and let you guys know to go join the, the Q&A. So I will see you next weekend.
you know, just actively remind people that like, hey, hire me as a DP and director now or right. again. Which, which I think so. in the second section is why I moved it in the direction that I did, where we talk yeah. about you as a cinematographer. We yeah. we're gonna show you're real and it yeah. offers you the opportunity to because even though you've distanced yourself from the company professionally, the resource is still valuable to you in your professional life as a cinematographer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. And so let's talk about that. 